Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. I have an amazing show today and I'm going to tell you all about it in just a minute. But first, I'm going to let you know that the all new completely revised Should I Stay or Should I Go is now available. And through Wednesday, April 20th, you can get it for $200 off. So um, the new price for this new special completely revised program, I shot all new videos and everything. Um, the full price is going to be now $697, 697, um, or four payments of 187. But until Wednesday, April 20th, you can get it for 497 or six payments of $87. So we have an extended payment plan and $200 off. So this is, like I said, all new, completely revised, brand new videos, brand new content, um, also revised versions of the content that you know and love. And if you are already in the Should I Stay or Should I Go program, you can upgrade for a fairly nominal fee. So um, all that information will be emailed to you as well. So keep an eye out on your inbox. So yeah, super exciting, guys. It's been three years. It's been three years since I created this program. And as I grew and I learned and I grew in my in my practice and, you know, and as I spent more and more time the last three years with all of you, um, especially those in my Facebook group, I've come to have a clearer, a bit of a clearer understanding about what it is that you guys really need, the, like the questions that you really need answered to make this difficult decision. So uh, I decided it was time for a little, uh, a little upgrade, a little revamp, a little facelift, makeover, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so the link will be in the show notes. Uh, if you go to my website, kateanthony.com, you will see a drop down link that says, uh, should I stay? I think and click on that and you'll find it. So kateanthony.com, find it. All right. So today my guest is Annette Altmans. She is a philanthropist and a passionate human rights advocate. And Annette's personal experiences of prolonged emotional abuse in marriage and her extensive journey of recovery, including comprehensive field research into the topics of original abuse and double abuse, which um, is a, 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 something that she coined, um, ignited her passion to founding the MEND Project in 2016. While seeking the help of professionals and responders, she experienced double abuse in the form of spiritual and institutional abuse, and these harmful encounters compelled Annette in her relentless pursuit for solutions that involved interviews with hundreds of victims and survivors. She uncovered common threads that cause victims prolonged states of confusion, as well as what ultimately led them towards healing. Her journey also involved interviews with hundreds of faith-based leaders and therapists, which led her to discover that most are untrained and ill-equipped to identify and help victims of emotional, verbal, and psychological abuse. So in her work to prevent and remediate this harm, Annette developed um, protocol models that are now being taught and implemented with therapists, churches, and professional organizations across the United States. And... Um, I met Annette when I was doing my domestic violence advocacy training um, last month. Um, did I tell you guys? I'm not sure if I told you guys in the podcast that I'm now a certified um, certified domestic violence advocate in the state of California. Um, and I met Annette because she did a training in that 40-hour training 
um, on emotional abuse. And I was just, you know, my head was, was bobbing along. Yes, 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 yes. And I was like, I have to know this woman. So um, I invited her to be on the podcast and here she is. She does a training for victims and survivors um, in August, actually. she does, the, the MEND Project does trainings on emotional abuse and on covert emotional abuse. I am in that training right now because I really thought that that it was so good. But she, th- these trainings are, f- as we'll talk about in the in the episode, the trainings are for both victims, survivors, and responders. So, but in August, she has a new cohort beginning for victims and survivors in high conflict relationships. If you're interested in taking that training, I highly recommend it. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. And you can find more information. Um, if you actually just reach out to info at themendproject.com, they'll be able to send you all the information about that. So without further ado, here is my conversation with the lovely and amazing Annette. Annette, thank you so much for being here. I am, I got to tell you, super honored, super honored that you have decided to join us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really, I love, I love the work that you're doing at the MEND Project. Mm, and thank you. Why don't you tell the listeners, first of all, what the MEND Project is, what, you know, how this came to fruition? How did you, sure. how did you create this incredible thing? Well, um, I had come through my own journey of um, covert emotional abuse, or you could say coercive control in my marriage. And it was so elusive. I I just had such a hard time defining what was happening. And um, I had, we had been to couples therapy and we had the resources to get these great therapists who were published and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And nobody was identifying abuse. Nobody was telling me that I was being mistreated. Nobody was focusing on the um, obvious inconsistencies and the, um, the, the mind games that were even playing out in a therapeutic setting. And so I just started researching um, everything that I could about this emotional, emotional abuse and this elusive aspect that I had not heard of before, which is coercive control or covert emotional abuse. And I realized that there weren't a lot of resources available. And so um, I was not only motivated by that factor, but the secondary thing that happens to so many victims when they try to tell their story is they're not believed or they're ignored or they are judged, they're criticized, they're given like in the therapeutic setting, incorrect instructions that absolutely do nothing but re-traumatize you because they don't produce any fruit and they actually um, place responsibility on the victim as though mm. there's something that the victim could actually do. And it's it. so I just realized I, I started interviewing hundreds of victims, hundreds of therapists and hundreds of faith leaders because statistics show that victims reach out to therapists and faith leaders first, because they don't even realize that they need the help of a domestic violence shelter. And so I just saw this void um, where they weren't getting their needs met. In fact, they were being harmed a second time by these responders. And so I labeled that double abuse because most of the victims that I interviewed were more interested and more compelled to talk to me about that secondary layer of of abuse that they viewed as more traumatizing than the original abuse. And so I was just so curious by this phenomenon. And that's why I just felt there has to be a name attached to this secondary experience. And that's why I came up with double abuse, because if you say secondary abuse, it has multiple meanings Mm -hmm. and it doesn't Mm -hmm. really apply. And so um, I just felt that there was such a void. I wanted to produce a website where victims could download things for free. It's not, it doesn't, it's not counseling for them, but it's tools that they can then use to advocate for themselves with their therapist, with their faith leader for themselves. Um, And then we started training therapists and faith leaders so that they wouldn't doubly harm victims. And it's just been this ongoing process. Yeah. That's kind of what started it. Yeah. 
I love it. And your resources are so good. Um, I, you. you know, I signed up for, um, I think, you know, this I'm in your program right now because I wanted to learn more, um, about the work that you do. And I love the other day I got in the mail, those, the flashcards, like, Oh, that's I, great. Oh my God. What a great, like, so cool. Um, but also your, the way that I think the way that you have broken things down, like, mm-hmm. um, the terms and definitions, which we'll link to those. So, um, you have the, the terms and definitions, which I think are, I mean, like literally mind blowing. Um, it's two pages of terminology and definitions that are so incredibly insightful and useful and helpful. I think. Yeah. This, this thing, covert emotional abuse, like I said, it's so elusive that what was my problem was I had such a hard time, even though I felt I'm a reasonably intelligent person and so many victims I interviewed, you know, some of them were running fortune 500 companies, you know, it was all walks of life. Why are they having the same problem stuck in this confusion? Like I was, and Mm -hmm. it's, because we didn't have the terminology to describe these confusing, manipulative behaviors that need, when you have a name and a definition, then you're able to, um, you have the language to articulate your experience, which immediately then resolves the confusion because confusion creates tremendous stress. And the stress is what I noticed. These poor victims and survivors were just bogged down with this, with the symptoms of stress, the emotional um, effects, losing their cognitive ability. And physiologically, they would become, have all these illnesses that required the attention of a physician. So it's stress is very damaging and clarity um, is what we often say at the men project is the first step necessary to the healing journey until you can identify what you experienced. You don't even know how to heal because you don't know what you're healing from. And Mm -hmm, so, um, mm -hmm. and I want to just mention, since you mentioned you are in our group right now, it's a cohort. We have Mm -hmm. a a curriculum um, where we take seven weeks um, of there's an online written curriculum that takes about 20 to 30 minutes a week. And then we do a one hour live session with me each week to expand on those topics. And Mm -hmm. that's available to anybody who would like to participate. Yeah. And, and what's, and I think what's really important to mention about this training is that it's actually not really geared towards professionals. It's actually geared towards victims, right? To help you get clarity or both. um, We, we actually, we, it's, we cover, we address responders and we address victims. So in most of our cohorts, we have both victims and responders. We've trained a lot of therapy groups, a lot of faith leaders. Um, and sometimes there's victims in the group too, or sometimes we just do a victim cohort. The cohort that you're in right now has more victims than responders. Um, we, we designed it that way so that we could um, change our language a little bit, but we also cover responders. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just, but just wanted to, to point out that like, you know, if I'm taking the class, it's because I'm a professional, I am also a victim. Um, but I want people listening to know that this is available for them as well. Cause I think it's yeah. really, it's really important. Okay. So let's talk about, since we've been talking about some of these definitions and how important they are, um, let's talk about, can you sort of run through a few of them? I mean, there's a lot of them. Sure. I know there's so many, and there's even more on our website that they can, that anyone can download for free in PDF fashion, but just to take a couple of terms, what often happens in relationships where covert emotional abuse is present is multiple behaviors. So I'm just going to focus on some most common ones. Um, Lying. It's not always present, but there'll be some degree of white lies or big lies um, or, um, or omission. That's very common. Another one is blame shifting where you raise a reasonable complaint or concern, something that bothers you, hurts you, whatever. And suddenly you're the one that, um, is being blamed for the problem. So for example, if somebody, um, if your partner, um, uses an offhanded joke that puts, puts you down, 
and you say, wow, that really wasn't nice. That hurt. Oh, you're too sensitive will be the response as an example. So now you get pain twice. You get pain from the off color joke, and then you're told you're too sensitive. So the problem is laid at the victim's feet. That's what blame shifting accomplishes is that the abuser doesn't take responsibility for their actions. Most of their actions are meant to avoid accountability or avoid responsibility. So it gets turned around on the victim. Another one that's really common is minimization. And I want to borrow the actual uh, definition that we write. It's abusive belittling of the victim's perspective with the intention to make the victim's values unimportant, which then has the result of killing their confidence. It kills their creativity and individuality. So minimization could be that you raise um, a point or you could even be celebrating something or you could be expressing a creative idea, something you want to do with decorating the house. And it could be a fabulous idea, but it gets undermined. It gets minimized. It's you're you're told it's a dumb idea or that's not important to me. So I don't not interested in that. Um, any way to discount the victim's enthusiasm, confidence, creativity. Um, it's meant to just diminish their, what they value. Mm -hmm. Another common one is deflection. Deflection is a defense. A lot of these are defensive tactics to avoid responsibility or, um, but deflection is really common. Like you, the victim will raise a complaint or concern. And then rather than staying focused on that issue, the abuser changes the topic um, to avoid having to discuss authentically what the victim really needs to talk about. And so these various um, ploys, techniques are ways to avoid authentic discussion and to, because to, in an authentic discussion, there's mutuality, there's mutual respect, there's mutual listening, there's a desire, there's a curiosity to want to understand each other's ideas and feelings. And then you move through to a solution, a compromise, a resolution with yeah. this respect intact. And an abuser will be defensive and, and block stonewall. It's another term, stonewalling. Deflections are a stonewalling technique. Minimization is a stonewalling technique. Blame shifting is a stonewalling technique to avoid resolving a conversation, to avoid having a meeting of the minds to avoid intimacy, emotional intimacy and celebration of each other's individuality. And so the victim feels isolated, alone, misunderstood. And instead of them being able to identify these things, because they're so confusing when multiple behaviors are being thrown at them, sometimes in one conversation, there's multiple behaviors they start to internalize it as though something is wrong with them. I must not be communicating effectively. I must not deserve the kind of love that I'm really seeking. Maybe I'm unlovable. I remember feeling that. Maybe I just don't know how to do relationships. Maybe I don't, maybe I'm not a lovable person because why isn't he showing me empathy and really understanding me? And so um, it's these ploys that ultimately, um, unless you, have been raised in an environment where you have maybe therapists as parents who are teaching you emotional language. <laughs> you don't have the ability to identify these confusing tactics. Right. And so you just don't have the language. And so you, you internalize it as though something's wrong with you. I'm curious about something, right? You, and you do, right. And then you go to therapy right? Cause there's something wrong with me. Okay. So then you go to more therapy yourself and then you go, you know, you take workshops or, you know, personal development workshops, you do all this work on yourself. Right. But it's still happening. So like I'm fixing myself, I'm fixing myself, I'm fixing myself, but it's still happening. Right. Yep. And I'm curious about in your experience, you talked about how you were in therapy with some of the, you know, best therapists, um, out there and that you weren't, you, nobody was saying this. And so you went in search of some information, but what, how, what, how did you even know what you were looking for? Well, I, I started really, um, there came a point where I was first just, I went to marriage enrichment classes with my husband, marriage intensives, yeah. all these 
so right. much effort. I was so exhausted. Um, yep, me too. Same girl. <laughs> I just started, I started seeing some of the patterns and mm-hmm. I would try to focus on the patterns in therapy and say, you know, he just, he is, he's, I, I might have thought up one or two of the words minimize me, or mm-hmm. he doesn't value me, or he doesn't keep his promises. Broken promises is another one. And therapists mm-hmm. get so confused by this. They think, well, we can all forget, but when there's a pattern of broken promises, like I promise to change, I promise to keep my word. When I say I'm going to golf three Saturdays a month, instead of every Saturday, a month, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but they don't keep their word. And So I started developing a knowledge of some of the patterns. And then instead of them recognizing the patterns of these behaviors that are abusive, they would get stuck in the minutia of each event, which has nothing to do with, you have to solve the patterns first before you get into the minutia. You have to address abusive tactics before anything else can be addressed because otherwise they end up placing some responsibility on the victim. Like, well, why don't you want them to golf every Saturday? That has nothing to do with it. It's the broader theme of broken promises that's pervasive in the relationship. And there's an integrity issue and Mm -hmm. that's what should have been addressed. And instead, then when you focus and you apply some responsibility on the victim, even if it's just 10% responsibility on the victim, the abuser will take that 10% as though it's 100% of the problem. And so that's why good therapists that are experts in abuse say nothing should be addressed before the abuse is confronted, unpacked, resolved with measurable um, evidence of change with um, reparations equal to the harm that was done. I mean, really hard work for the abusive person to have to make up for what they've done, but that is what healthy abuse therapy looks like. And, and that therapy is not couples therapy. No, it's not because (laughs) um, there's just no winning in couples therapy, but a good abuse therapist will say something like, um, to the victim survivor, write down what it's like to live with your spouse, the good, bad, and the ugly. And so that she can, or he can give a narrative of some of the patterns that take place. And then that way the victim doesn't have to be face-to-face listening to like, for example, my husband used to just invent false arguments. Like it would be false accusations. And suddenly that was his defensive tactic. And it never dawned on me that he would actually be deceptive. And so I was just blindsided by these false narratives, feeling that I had to work extra hard. And suddenly I was on the hot seat having to explain why that isn't what happened and, or it wasn't my intent or something. And the whole therapeutic session gets monopolized by something that didn't even happen. Right. It's very traumatizing. And so Mm -hmm. that's why they just address the abuser separately and a good therapist will allow for the victim to check in with the therapist, like send an email once a week or once a month or however often they need to. I was separated from my husband. So um, it would just be if I had any contact with him, I would just write the therapist. This is what happened. And then the therapist will confront him on those specific things, which keeps the integrity of the therapeutic process instead of where the victim has no access. And then the abuser can just be saying whatever they want to, to the therapist without any other reality check. And, and so how many therapists are out there that actually know and do this? There's not very many (laughs) sad to say, yeah, I'm so sad to say that. I think therapists are becoming more and more aware of like narcissism, narcissistic abuse and the impacts it has on victims, but they still don't really understand um, as much as they need to about the topic. And they don't get the training in their academic studies. It's something that they have to pursue in continuing education units afterwards. And if they're not told in their academic studies that they even need this training, most of them don't even know to yeah. obtain it. I mean, think of it. They graduate as marriage and family therapists, and yet they haven't had no DV training. violence training. Right. That's insane. It's insane. It it's insane. insanity 
in today's day and age, especially, Mm -hmm. right? I agree. Do you have some of the stats on the success rates of this kind of therapy? If, if there is a, an abuse therapy, a good abuse therapist who identifies this and says, okay, you step out, we're got, we got work to do here. What do you see as the success rates with that? The only six stats that I'm aware of is um, between three and 13% of people will change, but in with an expert, I'm not sure how much higher those numbers are. Mm-hmm. I will say that it takes at least a couple of years of intense therapy for the abuser to have a complete change of mind. I And we can get into this when I talk to you about the pillars of abuse, but mm-hmm. they have an entirely different worldview about how relationships are supposed to, to work. And yes. so- Yes, it's, it's, it's a big distance for them to travel, to change their mindset, which I think it's probably a good time for me to talk about the pillars of abuse. If you would like, yeah, to let's do it. That. No, let's absolutely do it. So, yep. um, the pillars of abuse is a term that we use to represent what drives abusive thinking. And it's, it's, um, entitlement where they feel that they deserve, you know, double standards. What's rules that apply to the victim don't apply to them or preferential treatment that applies to the abuser doesn't apply to the victim. So it's this entitlement patriarchy um, often (laughs) can, can develop a sense of entitlement. Then the next pillar is a faulty belief system. So depending on, oftentimes we see in certain ethnic cultures, there's a machismo um, attitude where if the male is the abuser and not all men are abusers and not all women are victims, it can go the other way, but the predominant uh, percentage is that it's male abusers. And so we see this faulty belief system in different cultures or um, patriarchy, again, I can say, will um, drive this sense where they have a hierarchical position in the relationship and they feel from that that the their spouse is supposed to behave in certain ways and meet all their needs. And when that doesn't happen, they are become aggressive or feel that they're being slighted. The third pillar is called image management. And that's where the abuser really works hard to portray an image to the outside that's different from the his behaviors that he's demonstrating on the inside. And that's where a lot of people say, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, uh-huh. um, the victim isn't believed because the abuser does things like he's philanthropic or he's volunteers at church or in the community. And he does things to appear as though it's very conscious. They're very concerned about image management. They might also do things like undermine the victim's credibility in public with just little white lies or little um, just uh, mischaracterization comments about the victim so that if the victim ever speaks out, people won't believe her. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the, mm-hmm. Those are the three pillars. And then there's a fourth pillar when double abuse um, happens, when somebody doesn't believe the victim or when they judge the victim, it could be um, somebody in their social setting, a family member. It could be an institutional situation like for sexual harassment if the institution doesn't support the victim, they this fourth pillar is giving preferential treatment to their favored individual. So it could be somebody who has their same uh, political beliefs. Oh, well, then that person couldn't possibly be. Oh, they go to my church. They couldn't possibly be an abuser. Oh, he's the dean of the law school. He couldn't possibly be um, guilty of sexual harassment. Right. They just give a pass to their favored people um, for various reasons, which um, is a form of abuse in itself. 
And this is what we saw with Harvey Weinstein, with yes. Mary Nassar, right? Yeah. With all of those cases. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, they were supported by the people around them, which actually, if you if you participate in double abuse or you support the perpetrator, you actually prevent the light from being shined on the situation so that it can be confronted and resolved. You actually perpetuate more abuse. You keep the abuser in his place where he can abuse more victims. That's right. That's right. You think about Larry Nassar, right? From the beginning, one of the, you know, one of the first gymnasts that, you know, came forward till when he finally got, you know, arrested and fired. Yeah, there were hundreds. There were hundreds of them. And those poor girls were doubly abused by Michigan State University. Exactly. By right. USA Gymnastics. I mean, yep. all the minimization, all the criticism that they received. Yep. You should be so grateful to have this esteemed physician. Just they yes, were right. And that is the that is the, that is double abuse right there. Yes, and that's exacerbated their trauma. Exactly. And because now they're now they're questioning themselves, they're 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 being gaslit, they're you know, they're gaslighting themselves. What oh I, I should be grateful, but I'm also feeling this other thing. It's wrong to feel this other thing. Maybe I maybe it's me, maybe I have it wrong. You know, um, maybe he didn't really touch me that way. Maybe what he was doing was right. Maybe he it was he was supposed to touch me there for, you know, you know, a left arm injury. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah, exactly. And then even what was the Michigan State and USA Gymnastics prolonged the double abuse. They they became more focused on the liability factor than they did on doing the right thing. Right. And so they were really betrayed. That's right. Institutions. That's right. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor today. For over a decade, I've helped divorcing moms put their children at the center of all of their decisions. So whenever I hear about moms struggling to co-parent with an ex that abuses alcohol, I have one system in mind, Soberlink. Soberlink's alcohol monitoring system is the most convenient, reliable, and reasonable way for a parent to provide evidence that they're not drinking during parenting time. Soberlink's real-time alerts, facial recognition, and tamper detection ensure the integrity of each test, so you can be confident your kids are with a sober parent. With Soberlink, judges rest assured that your child is safe, Attorneys get court-admissible evidence of sobriety, and both parents have empowerment and peace of mind. Trust the experts in remote alcohol monitoring technology to keep you informed and your kids safe and secure. To download the resource I created with Soberlink, Checklist for High Conflict Divorces, visit Soberlink.com slash DSG. And now, back to our show. I, I wanted to also mention that um, in a domestic violence situation, let's say your husband is not an overt abuser where they're yelling and raging and loud put downs. Yep. Let's say they're not a physically violent person, that their their um mo- their their MO is coercive control, covert emotional abuse. Um It's such, it's so embedded in their Mm. belief system that to change, I use the example, it'd be like, if if I I use like a political backdrop as an example, if a left-leaning Democrat had to, was told they have to become a right-leaning Republican or vice versa, if you think about how much reading you would have to do, how much mentoring and confrontation and difficult discussions to travel that distance, it would take a tremendous amount of time and it likely doesn't usually happen. And so it's, right. it's kind of the same thing where they have an entirely different worldview um, without empathy, where they just have these expectations that are, that the victim is supposed to meet. And when they don't meet them, they experience retaliation and punishment and the silent treatment and so many punitive um, responses that for an abuser to change their mindset, it's, it's just really difficult undertaking. Yeah. And, and, and it requires them to actually want to change, which is essentially the first 
barrier because I think because they're uh, what they're after is power and control, right? They're not actually after. And this is what I think is so confusing to so many um, victims is that we're like, oh, but I love you. So like, I want to make this relationship better so that we can better love each other. But the, but the abuser's point of view is I want to, I want power and control. Right. Yeah. They're not they're not there to make the relationship better. They're not there to love you. They're there for power and control. And we have Correct. to adjust our like you said, it's a worldview. It's like completely different. Yes. And they won't admit that they won't come out and say, I want power and control. They'll confuse the victim by saying, you're the most important person in the world to me. I love you. Why are you questioning? Even though their actions speak something very different. Right. And that confuses the victims even further. And I think if you are somebody who, you know, most victims, right, are some, somewhat empathic, and then until you have come across something like this in your life, like, it doesn't make sense because you're trying to fit it into all of the slots that you understand, <laughs> right? Yeah, they're trying to, re- they think every, victims are usually very empathic. Right. Um Abusers usually seek out empathic individuals because they like all the benefits of an empathic person. They want all the benefits of that help, that kind and loving person, but they don't want to give it back. They feel they're entitled that that's just the way it is. They're entitled to the, that treatment, but they don't have to reciprocate. And so give it. They don't have to exactly. <laughs> and so their worldview is just they're playing from an entirely different playbook and. The empathic one, the victim, thinks that everyone relates empathically. And so they're just so confused. It literally receiving empathy, not understanding that they're dealing with someone who doesn't relate the same way that they do by any means. There's absolutely no commonality to their approaches to the relationship. Yeah. And again, like you're coming at, I always think about an ex, you know, extreme cases where um, in my family, there was somebody who was actually psychotic. Um, she was a pathological liar. She, I mean, was truly, truly psychotic. And, you know, but when she would say that David Geffen was her best friend and that Keanu Reeves was her best friend, I don't, I, until that time, I didn't go through the world thinking that I had to question what normal people were saying to me. Right. Right. Like you just don't, you're like, oh, wow. Okay, cool. You um, trust, you, you right? trust people. You trust people because that's, that's what most people do. Yeah. That's and what they're doing. They're being honest. They wouldn't lie right. about such I things. Wouldn't, so I wouldn't lie it. about my friends. I wouldn't lie about, you know, like, I mean, this woman lies about literally everything. I wouldn't like, I wouldn't, I, I, like, I wouldn't do that. So it took a long time to sort of, shift and be like, oh no, oh no, everything, (laughs) literally everything out of her mouth is a lie. And it had to be a, like a big realization, like a big thing happened for me to be like, oh, okay. Let me just like adjust my worldview that like people like this exist. Right. And I think as an empath who is in a marriage with a relationship with someone that they love, the idea that their spouse is not in the same worldview is super confusing. It's totally unexpected. I, I remember, and, and I just have to say, my husband and I were able to resolve our relationship. He went through years of intense therapy. We were separated for three years. I worked on my trauma and myself. He worked on him. I didn't think we were getting back together, but um, it is, it is. we happen to be a success story and I don't recommend it, but I can say it was really a difficult road. Mm-hmm. Um, but when, when um, a victim finally realizes that, like you came to the realization with your family member that you had to adjust your worldview for a victim to get to that place, a new stress um, takes over. And I just want to touch on well, my husband used to deflect and create all these little false arguments. And it wasn't until one day when I realized he was blowing this small matter into a two day argument. He just was, just wouldn't stop arguing. And 
um, I realized that the arguments that he laid out the day before were now contradicting the arguments that he was laying out today. And it just hit me like a like a flash of lightning. And I said, you just you're contradicting you're contradicting yourself. And he said, you found me out. That's what I do. And I just remember chills going up my spine. You mean you actually know what you're doing and you 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 know you're doing this to me on purpose. This high level of deception and stress is something that you actually are cognizant of. It then a new kind of stress comes in the scene. You have to determine what are you going to do with your life, realizing that you are dealing with somebody who is not safe and they're not going to be safe. It's a big, and they um, know it and they don't care. They know it. And this is what they do and they don't care how it affects you. Yeah. And so it was such a shocking moment for me to come to realize that I had to completely change my, um, the way that I was operating change my view of what the relationship was, but at least I had an accurate perception. Now it wasn't being confused by all these manipulative tactics, right? But it's still another phase that the victim has to go through to now determine what the next steps are. Does she leave? Does she stay? Does she detach? Does she seek an expert abuse there? You know, what, Yeah. What are the next steps? And will he go? Right. Like that's exactly like that's the thing. So, and I think that something that's really important, and I want to highlight this in your story because I hear this all the time from um, my clients, people in my Facebook group, my followers that talk about, you know, will he change? Can he change? Right. And I, um, and what I always say is maybe, probably not, maybe, Mm -hmm. but only if you actually leave and remove yourself from the situation because his protestations, his, you know, promising that he's going to change will last maybe, maybe three months max, right? Usually two to three weeks. Yeah. Um, and then he's going to go back because there's no consequence. There's, for no, his, consequence. there's no consequence, right? He, he has, yeah, they, you, they right? say he often you. you're, you're so, Right. They, um, they, a phrase that I really like is they have to experience a breakdown before Mm -hmm. they can experience a breakthrough. Absolutely. They need to feel pain and loss. Otherwise there is no motivation. They like what they have. They, it works well for them. It works so well for them. Why would they change? There's no reason to change. They're getting everything they want. Absolutely. Literally everything they want. That's right. Yeah. And so, and so it is important to remove yourself from a situation, um, entirely. And as you did with no expectation of getting back together, but with, you know, and, and, and to say like, go do your work if you're serious about this. So how did you, how did that conversation happen for you? I'm curious. Was it, was it really him? Like, how did he go from that guy the, the guy who was like, you found me out to yeah. actually being the guy who was like, oh shit, uh, let me do the work. I think he, um, I sent him a couple of books when we were separated and like one, um, is by Patricia Evans, a verbally abusive relationship. Yeah. And he told me that he threw it across the room when it came to unpacking patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And, um, and I think that he saw me, um, really become stronger and, um, I didn't become mean or anything. I was kind, but I was firm. And I think he just had kind of a light bulb moment that he was still had a selfish mindset And, um, so he basically said that he would be willing to try anything to save the marriage. And I said, well, I don't know if it's going to work, but I heard of this place, the marriage recovery center, um, which is up in Washington state. And they, this is basically 
the most of what they do. And um, I figured if he wants to go do the work, I'm not going to go into couples therapy. I will mm-hmm. That's right. make the effort to write a letter to, you know, but I'm exhausted. I, and just focusing on my trauma symptoms and healing and all of that. And he started doing the work and um, not to say that he didn't, he, he, he will tell you this openly. He resisted. He didn't like it. He almost quit multiple times. Um, He had very different perspectives. I would send an email that said this occurred. He had an entirely different perspective yet. Thank goodness. The counselor just kept confronting him and holding him to account. And like I said, he wanted to quit, but he stuck with it. And ultimately at about a year and a half into it, I noticed some pretty significant changes and um, some self-awareness that he had. And I didn't, we, we talk at the men project about um, controlled separation or a therapeutic separation where you both agree about to the boundaries. Like, are you going to date? Are you not going to date? Who Mm -hmm. are you going to fight in? Mm -hmm. Um, Who are safe people who are not safe people? Um, Are you going to see each other? Are you not going to see each other? We didn't see each other for a long time. Um, And then there's a controlled reconciliation where you might go on a date, you know, once a month and see how it goes. And if there's any red flags, then you pull back and say, I'm not going to, you have more work to do. I'm not going to, you, you just don't let down your boundaries. If it's too soon, it's all going to come back again. And that's so traumatizing for victims to have to keep going through these setbacks. So for me, I remained distant and would just test the waters until there was enough consistency that um, I felt we could maybe go on a weekend date or something like that. But it was very, very gradual over a year a year after the year and a half, it was another year before we, um, he moved back into the house. God, I I talk about the separation thing all the time too, with like, don't people say like, Oh, well, he's doing the work where he got a therapist and then they'll let, then they'll like, let him back in the house. No, 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 no. It takes a long time. Every expert says that. Yes. in Lundy Bancroft's book, he says mm-hmm. it takes mm-hmm. a couple of years, years and he's the number one abuse. Um, why does he do that is the yep. title. Yep. And um, Dr. David Hawkins, who's at the Marriage Recovery Center, he speaks at conferences all over the country. He's written tons of books on the subject, too. He says that in the best of circumstances, it takes these guys a couple of years to change. Right. So I, I'm always yep. telling women don't think that you're going to send him and in a month, you're going to have a changed man. And that too is a hard reality for them to face. That's right. They usually cry because the realization that this is a long process. Um, there's no quick fixes is daunting for a lot of them. You know, and the other thing is that as we do our own work, right? Because while they're off doing their work, we're doing our own, as you said, you were doing trauma recovery work. And, you know, we are, we're doing our own work. And as we do our own work, like we grow and sometimes we outgrow the relationship. Sometimes Mm -hmm. we're like, Oh, actually too, too much trauma. You've hurt me way too much. Yes. Um, and I actually don't actually want you anymore. Right. And I think that, or I I don't want to expose my body to any more trauma. Like I can't tolerate anymore. And I think it's really important that we not judge victims, even if the person has changed, if they can't expose themselves to any more, they they just have to self-preserve. I think Mm -hmm. a lot of faith communities make the mistake and they prioritize the institution of marriage more than the well-being of the victim and children inside the marriage. And they think that just because the husband apologized that he's, it means automatic change or that even if they've been separated and he's really apologetic, that that means change. The only person who can make that decision is the victim based on those super subtle and intimate encounters and based on how his or her body is responding to those coercive behaviors. We can't impose upon them that they need to endure more when trauma is so 
damaging to a person's mind and body. Mm, amen. Amen. It, I mean, it, it really, really is. It really is. Before we go, I, I could talk to you forever. Um, <laughs> but we, we will, con- we will continue this conversation, but do you have Christian, um, listeners. I do. I have a lot. I'd love to just talk yes. about one verse it's in yes. Malachi and I can't remember the number, but it's the one that people have heard so much. God hates divorce, but I just want to say that, um, that's not the full verse. Um, there's not a period after the word divorce. It says God hates di- divorce um, and those who cover their garments in violence. And violence can mean emotional violence, physical violence, but the two are meant to go together. It's not a separate concept. And I just want to encourage your listeners to not feel guilty or feel pressured that they, you know, God doesn't want them to be oppressed. Right. He doesn't want them to suffer. The, the, the sanctification of the marriage has already been broken um, when there is oppression and, and all of that that enters the scene. Those vows have already been broken. It's not behaving as the believer. And so I just want to encourage them to not... You know, a lot of church personnel inadvertently spiritually abuse their congregants, and there are other churches that won't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just encourage them to find a place where they're going to be accepted and allow for their own decision-making process to take root, where they're not being pressured to leave or pressured to stay. Yes. Yes. I think that is so important. And I love the idea that like what you said about the vows have already been broken. If you Mm -hmm. are filing for divorce because you have been abused, you are not breaking your vows. They have been broken already. Yeah. Um, Right. And I always say, I'm like, he did this. He did this. You're not doing it. He did it. And the longer kids are in that environment, the more likely the chances that one or more of them will pick up the same subtle behaviors because they don't want to be a victim. They would rather be an abuser or in many cases, they don't want to be an abuser. So they choose to be a victim because they haven't had good role modeling. So it's really statistics show that it's very damaging for kids to be in that kind of environment, even if it's just coercive control. And I say just, I don't mean, yeah. I mean, the Centers for Disease Control considers it one of the most damaging forms of domestic violence. But I think a lot of people think, well, I didn't hit you. Right. So oh, it, didn't hit, yeah, exactly. And yet yeah. it, we still don't have actual laws against it in the U.S. That's true. Go I know. Figure. It's, because it's, I mean, it's we're really far behind. We're far behind. But even in the U.K., where it is illegal, it's still hard to prove. And it's almost mm-hmm. rarely, very rarely prosecuted because it's so hard. You know, there's very little empirical evidence of it. Right. Yeah. It's really difficult. Uh, it's so hard. Um, oh my gosh. And that, thank you so much for, for this, tell everyone where they can find the mend project and all of your incredible, incredible work. Thank you so much, Kate. Yes. Um, listeners, you can go to the mend M E N D project.com and explore our website. Please take your time and find all the little nooks and crannies because we have so many resources and um, a lot of information that will help you help someone else or will help you advocate for yourself. And I can't tell you how many therapists I, I hear from that use this to help their clients and how many clients bring it to their therapists to help them advocate for themselves. So it's really a useful tool. And we we answer all of our emails. You can email us at info at the men project.com and we will respond within 24 or 48 hours. Ugh, you guys are doing such incredible work. I'm so happy that I found you and um I'm yeah, I'm so grateful for all of your wisdom and and your and your personal journey. I think it's so unique and it's so important that people hear not just that, like, you know, sure, sometimes they change, but actually what it takes on both yeah. sides. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I, 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 I just so appreciate that you have that, that insight and experience. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much, Annette. 
Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.